whenever there is a trial or a temptation that comes in or any hardship, the faith what we had that brought us to him is totally abandoned. Hope you can agree with this. This goes with me and for all the people who are listening and who will be listening. But what God says is during those harsh real time we need to bring our confidence up by responding to the scriptures so that our faith will grow. Now the question comes if God wants us to become more and more like Jesus, how does this happen? Right? This is always a question for us. The question, how does it happen? The answer for this question is, it's through the scripture. God has given the scripture to us. We are so fortunate that we have the whole Bible in our hands in our language, wherein we can read on it, meditate on it, memorize those words, and apply those words to our lives. Gracious God, Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for you going to speak with us, Lord. Thank you for your presence. You had a plan and a purpose to giving this word of you, Lord. Show us the insights. Revert us the message deep in our hearts. Cement them so that they will never leave away from our hearts and our minds. And help us to read and meditate upon your words. Transform us in the way that you want us, Lord. Be with us throughout this time. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Yeah, amen. Amen. Today we will be looking into the book of James. Um, this message is not to be more a preachable message, what I'm going to do today is more like a teaching message where we will be looking into more insights of each and every verse. God willing, we will try to cover the whole of the book of James in the coming months and days. Before we go into the detail of the James first chapter, whatever we want going to see today, we will see like who wrote this book. Because like when we want to learn more about God, we also need to know who wrote this book, on what circumstances they wrote, to whom they wrote. So we will first look into which James wrote this book. The reason why we put this question is we see more than one or two persons with the name of James occurring in the New Testament. One of the persons we see in the New Testament mentioned with the name James is we see in Luke chapter 6.16 mentioned as James, the father of Judas. Judas, which is not Judas Iscariot. And this James has got a, another name mentioned as Thaddeus. But except for this verse in Luke 6.16, we do not see any mention of this particular James. So, theologians rule out probably this James was not the person who wrote this book. The second James that comes in the New Testament is the James son of Zebedee and also the brother of John. This James has been mentioned in 
few of the verses in various books, uh, especially in Matthew 4, 21, 10, 2, and 17, 1. And this James was a person witnessing Jesus' miracles. He was also present during Jesus' transfiguration. And this James was also with Jesus when he was praying in Gethsemane. He was one of the 12 disciples. And he was the first disciple who was martyred with the stone, sword, I'm sorry, with the sword. This happened in AD 44 when Herod Agrippa was there. So the theologians say that this James is not the person who wrote the book of James. So now we are left with two more persons. One is James, son of Alphas, which is mentioned in Matthew 10, 3, and in Mark 3, 18, and Luke 6, 15. Again, he's one of the 12 disciples. And there's another James mentioned as James, son of Mary, mentioned in Matthew 27, 56, and in Mark 15, 40, and 16, 1. And he is one of the sons of Mary. This Mary was the person who witnessed Jesus' burial and resurrection. According to the theologians, they figure out, they conclude, they don't conclude completely, but they have a sort of like 75% they figure it out that this James son of Mary and the James of Alphas, which I mentioned earlier, probably these two people were the same. And they also come out strongly that these James did not write the book of James. So that is left with just only one person who is James, son of Joseph and Mary, and the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. We will be knowing him earlier in the book of John, where the same James, brother of Jesus, who denied Jesus Christ. He did not believe in Jesus Christ's ministry. If you look into John chapter 7, 5, it is written, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. But you know what happened? After Jesus' resurrection, he made a special appearance to his brother James, which made him a believer. And eventually, he became the leader of the first Jewish Christian church in Jerusalem. But he was martyred in 62 AD. During the period of this Herod Agrippa, there was a huge persecution that was happening. And all the Jewish Christ Christians, they were scattered all around the world. I'm not going to look into those informations, but we can read that in Acts chapter 12. <clears throat> so based on these informations, the theologians, they come out by saying that this James, son of Mary and Joseph, brother of Jesus, wrote the book of James. If you look into the big picture of the book of James, it is mentioned as to be maturing. Warren Wearsby writes as be mature. God created us for a plan and for a purpose. He, he builds us, he molds us, 
he molds us in a way that we are transformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. This is the theological and spiritual word by saying sanctification. The spiritual transformation. Sanctification happens inside out. We should be very careful to know the difference between salvation and sanctification. The moment when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, that is salvation. It's a one-time event that happens in a believer's life. This salvation happens outside to inside. By accepting Jesus Christ, we are salvaged from our old habit. That's salvation. But if sanctification is happening, this is a change that is happening from inside of us to the outside. This is a lifelong process. So we now know what salvation is and sanctification is. Sanctification is more focused here in James. That's the reason I told like it's a process to become mature in him. We see how we need to be growing as a Christian believer. We have to consider how we need to be sanctified in our life. Being a Christian is not an event. We have to know that. It's rather a journey. There are things that we need to learn in this long journey. The path is going to be long, winding, tiresome. We know that. We are experiencing it. So whoever who's now listening or people who will be listening, we know that as a believer, the Christian life is not an easy journey. And again, there are no shortcuts. Sadly, what happens is people, most of the people, once they get the salvation, they don't grow after that. They are not encouraged in their faith. They don't get mature enough in their prayer life, in their meditation on scriptures, and in their fellowship with God. God is not pleased when we do this act. When we look into 2 Peter 3.18, it says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Similarly, when you look into Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, it says, Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going to go through labor pains for you again, and they will continue until Christ is fully developed in our lives. So that shows the maturity and the transformation. And again, in chapter 3 of Second Corinthians, verse 18, the verse reads, So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. So 
Christ-like transformation is the ultimate goal for every Christian believer and who are followers of Christ. But this transformation occurs not in one day, but it's a daily process. We will begin to think like Jesus, see like Jesus, and treat our fellow people like him. Now the question comes, if God wants us to become more and more like Jesus, how does this happen? Right? This is always a question for us. The question, how does it happen? The answer for this question is, it's through the scripture. God has given the scripture to us. We are so fortunate that we have the whole Bible in our hands, in our language, wherein we can read on it, meditate on it, memorize those words, and apply those words to our lives. This Bible study, one of the authors, he writes, the Bible study is like going to the gym and working it out. It's more like a spiritual exercise. The reason why he quotes this, he quotes it from the first Timothy, fourth chapter, verses seven and eight, the later part of seven. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and the life to come. So spiritual training is good for us for this present life and for the life that is to come. This verse was written by Paul to Timothy to exercise spiritually. But you might be wondering, what has got all this to do in the book of James? Right? As I told you, the central theme of this book is maturity. There are several sections in this book which we have made it easy for our understanding. Before we go into the verses, we will see like what are all the sections that we have and what are all the main emphasis over there and what are all the key terms that are present in this book. So it will be easy for us to grasp the idea of his words that are going to be spoken to us. The first section is real faith produces genuine stability. Real faith produces genuine stability. This is found in first chapter from verse 1 to 27. And the main theme of this, these passages are joys and trials, <clears throat> facing temptation, and responding to the word. And the key terms used in this section are trials, perseverance, and religion. And the second section is real faith produces love. Real faith produces love, which is found in the second chapter from first verse to the third chapter of the twelfth verse. And the themes here are partiality and prejudice. Faith at work and bridling of our tongue. And the key terms used here are works, justification, and tongue. And the third section deals with real faith produces genuine humility which is found in the third chapter 
from verse 13 to the fifth chapter, verse 6. And Paul, James uses these themes, expression of the heart, settling disputes, expression of desire, and warning of the wealthy. And the key terms are jealousy, humble, and judge. And finally, the fourth section deals with real faith produces genuine patience. And the passages are from fifth chapter, verse 7, to the end of that chapter. And the main theme here is patience in suffering, sickness in sin, and carnality and correction. And the key themes are persevere and turn. So I will go through the sections again, so it will be easy when we read the passages and when we meditate on that. So the first section. Section is faith produces, real faith produces genuine stability. And the second section is genuine love. The third section is genuine humility. And the fourth section is genuine patience. Okay, when we look into all these things, we have got a question To whom did James write this message? To whom did James write this letter? <clears throat> the question we ask because like, we need to know when Paul wrote the letter to the Corinthians, he had a purpose. Like He wrote it to the Corinthians because like, they were drifting away. And then when he wrote the Galatians, he was addressing the Galatians for the legalism. right? And when he was writing this, he was writing it to the dispersed Jewish, Jewish Christians. They use the word like dispersed abroad, which comes from a Greek word called as diaspora. Diaspora is a Greek word which is meant as scattered. If you, if you, if you look into the nation of Israel as a whole, it was a divided kingdom. You know that. It was divided as Israel in the north and Judah as the southern kingdom. What happened during this period and after this period is during BC 721, the Assyrians, they captured the northern kingdom, which had all the 10 tribes. And the southern kingdom, Judah, was captured by the Babylonians, which happened in 586 BC, which had Judah and Benjamin. During this period, what happened and after that is, the northern tribes, they were not allowed to go back to their hometowns. But eventually, the southern kingdom people, they were allowed to go back to their hometown. If you, if you have the map of uh, the Middle East and Jerusalem during those period, the Jewish dispersal happened as far as Rome to the west and to Babylon, the present-day Iraq to the east, and if you look down south, they were dispersed in Egypt, Ethiopia, and to the north, they were somewhere near the Black Sea. So it was a huge dispersal of the Jewish people at that time. And again, as I told you, why did he wrote, I mentioned that these people, the dispersed people, were in huge distress. Every other nation, I think like, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like the reason when Paul wrote to the Romans, he wrote for those people for his intention to visit them. And the Corinthians, they had a lot of errors, you know that. They were having a lot of divisions, immorality, 
um, um, lawsuits among believers. And so there was a reason Paul was addressing the first, uh, first Corinthians and the second Corinthians to them. And then for the Galatians, they had a lot of legalisms that were going on and there were a lot of uh, false teaching that was going on. So there was a reason he was writing those things. And now James is addressing the Jewish Christians who are having a lot of problems in their lives as well as in their church fellowship. They were facing a lot of temptations. And these people, they were failing in their life for one reason. They believed Jesus Christ as their savior and they accepted him. But the way they were living was not reflecting that they were believers. They had huge issues with the way they were talking. That was the reason I mentioned earlier. It was because of the tongue. The tongue of them was creating a lot of divisions in the churches. And there were a lot of worldliness that came unto them and they were not able to follow Jesus Christ. Eventually what happened is they were disobeying the God's words. If you put everything together, there will be one terminology. It, those people were spiritually immature. So these Christians need to be growing spiritually. That's the reason this letter is written to them. So now we know the basic theme of this letter is the mark of maturity in Christian life. James uses, when, you, when, you, when we read this and when we try to meditate, you will be able to see that James is using the word perfect several times in this letter, which means a complete mature person. He writes perfect man in the third chapter and second verse. It does not mean that it's not a sinless man, but he is mentioning about a mature, grown-up, balanced man. This spiritual maturity is expected in every other person of a believer or a follower. This is also expected in our church life too. So if you look into the behavior of an immature person, there are a lot of impatience and people who are not living by the truth and people who doesn't control their tongue and they have got a lot of fighting and coveting. Now, when we look into this, before we read the verses, we would like to go into the preview of the whole book of James. If you, if you look into the verses, how James is addressing the very first verses, he is so humble, so humble enough to put himself who he was and why he is writing these letters. He is not trying to impress any of the readers. That's the main point we need to understand here. The reason why we say this is whenever somebody is expected to introduce himself, we always tend to show or tell about our big laurels, what we have achieved, what our background is. But when you look into the very first verses of James, James is so humble enough. That's the point I want to make here. We will go ahead and read the verses um, so we will be able to understand what we are going to study today. So I will be reading now from James chapter 1, from first verse to 
the 12th verse. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unable, unstable in all they do. Believers in high humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high positions, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom fails and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about in their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, after going through these verses, we would be seeing how James is starting this letter. He did not, as I mentioned, he did not write this to impress any of his readers. If he should have written as a regular person, he should have written James from the tribe of Judah, or he should have started it as James, the elder brother of Jesus, or he should have started at least like James, the very first pastor of the Jewish Christian church. He never, ever wrote that. Look at his humbleness. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he humbles himself and he has the submission to Jesus Christ as a, he doesn't consider that as a burden. His servanthood is not considered as a burden, but he considered as a glorious honor to him. That's the main thing we need to look here. And these Jewish Christians, as I told you, they were driven out of their Jewish communities because of their faith in Christ. And these people, they were suffering a lot and they had a lot of confusion among them. And they have a lot of crushing moments in their life. They were so weary that some of the historians record that these Jewish Christians, they were defecting from faith in Christ. So this letter of James was written about authentic faith lived out in a hostile world. As I told you, the main theme of this book is real faith produces genuine works. The genuine works is our maturity. In other words, the person who really found the way genuinely walks in it. 
if you if you claim that you have accepted Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, our lives should be giving an evidence to the other people who are looking at us how truthful we are. So let our outward reflect the inward reality. That is justification of our faith before others by our good works. I will repeat it again. Justification of our faith before others by good works. If we realize this theme, the individual sections, whatever I mentioned, like one to four sections, it will be very clear for us. And there are four sections in this book. The very first section we will be dealing today, James tells the readers, it's also for us, that real faith produces genuine stability. The whole of this chapter, it deals with when real faith is stretched, it doesn't break. Our faith is not broken when it is stretched, but it perseveres. To support this evidence, he gives three examples. First one, he says, he shows that the trials and the tribulations in our life, they do not destroy the faith but actually it deepens it and it causes our faith to grow, which we will be looking today from verse one to 12. And then the second one he reminds us, we can face these temptations through genuine faith, which we will be looking in the coming days in verses 13 to 18 of, chapter one and then he mentions about the true believers respond to god's word positively changing their lives to confirm them to their truth which we will be looking into verse 19 to 27 of the first chapter and the second major section it begins in second chapter all the way up to the third chapter of the 12th verse, where James argues that the real faith produces genuine love. Now we will go into each of the verses in chapter 1 from 2nd verse to the 12th verse. Real faith produces genuine stability. We know that Jesus Christ was tempted, he was tested, and he was tried for 40 days and for 40 nights. He was exhausted, he stumbled on rocks, he was wandering in that hot and brutal sun. But when you look into those physical troubles, whatever he was going on, there was nothing compared to the spiritual temptations he was facing. How do we know that? We know through the verses in Matthew 4 that Satan tempted the Son of God to satisfy his human cravings, right? If you find time, try to read Matthew chapter four, the first 12 verses. Satan tempts God to satisfy his human cravings. To circumvent God's plan for salvation through suffering. And he was even forcing tempting Jesus to fall down to worship him. So these are his spiritual temptations. 
but our lord he endured those period of physical temptations and he emerged victorious jesus temptations were not complete at that moment if you look closely into the picture his temptation was not complete after that 40 days and 40 nights his huge temptations came during that 3 years of his life on earth he was enduring rejection among his people and other people he was facing persecution he was facing false accusation he was abandoned he was insulted he was mocked he was beaten and finally he was crucified we all have known this history that it is his life was not an easy life that whatever he was leading he was put to trial and tribulations and he was suffering hardship we as believers followed him in baptism and we are indwelt by his holy spirit god has adopted us as his children but you know what happens we often forget the gift of faith that saved us whenever there is a trial or a temptation that comes in or any hardship the faith what we had that brought us to him is totally abandoned hope you can agree with this this goes with me and for all the people who are listening and who will be listening but what god says is during those harsh real time we need to bring our confidence up by responding to the scriptures so that our faith will grow when we look into the verses in the first chapter james argues that faith is put to test and it perseveres and it results in stability to demonstrate this point he gives us three examples he argues that the normal trials that accompany life don't crush the genuine faith but instead they produce endurance he notes the key to overcoming temptations is through god's strength that strength that will drive us through this efforts and finally he explains that the lord how he endured the trials in the wilderness by genuine faith resulting in the submission to god's word you know like how he responded to satan's temptations the responding through the words so this is the same for us conforming our image to the image of jesus christ and responding to the trials and tribulations through his words not by our own words it will not work so whatever we have as our hurts our heartaches our pain they form always a constant baseline for our life and how hard we try to conduct our life these are going to be always with us our heartaches our problem or disappointments this reality of suffering creates within us a question regarding god's justice and life you always agree with this when we have suffering 
and we have pain, you always have the question, where is God here? Where is God's justice in my life? Why did he create us? Why did he create all these issues for me? Why do I have to go through all the trials and tribulation? This is a question that most of the theologians, the philosophers, even we try to answer these questions. But in the end, the philosophers and other people, they don't have a natural answer for that. And even a layman who is not a believer, when he's not able to find the answer, he turns to drugs, alcohol, entertainment. You know how people indulge in other activities when they don't want to indulge themselves in spiritual activities. So as I mentioned earlier, the recipients of this letter were people who are going through all these troubles, and especially they were dispersed. They were not in their hometown, they were not in their home country, and they were totally disoriented and disillusioned. And they were feeling as if their bottoms were dropping out, and they were indulging in all other activities, and now James write this letter to them. When you look into the very first verse, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. The, 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 the main emphasis here James tries to say is the trials are inevitable. See, like if you look closely into the verse, he doesn't say consider it all joy if you fall into various trials, right? If you look into the verse, it says when, when you face trials of many kinds. Few things are certain in this world. Troubles, hardships, and challenges, they will come to us. And the second thing James tells us that these trials are various. We can expect the trials to come. We, it can come in any form, any shape, any size. It's more like an unwelcomed guest. Hope you can agree with that. These trials are always frustrating and they are always challenging our lives. But if you look into the following verses, James gives us the reason for the trials, the inner working of the trials, the purpose why we have these trials. As James traces the pathway of the Christian life, he reveals that the presence of the trials produces an immediate result. The first one is testing of faith produces endurance. That's what we see in the third verse, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. The object of, the main objective here in God's testing is our faith. You might be having a question like, is it God who is allowing his people all the trials to test us something, to break us? But no, that's not, that, that's not the way we should think. But God is our expert trainer. As I told you earlier, that how Paul wrote to Timothy for spiritual exercise, I feel like God is an expert trainer. He knows which muscles to develop and what diet we have to follow and what schedule we have to do for good things. So the prime goal is to not snap our 
faith muscles, but to stretch them and to strengthen them, producing endurance. Hope you should have heard of this saying here in the U.S., people always saying like, hang in there, hang in there. In spite of all the trials and the tribulations and the difficulties, people would say like, come on, hang in there. That's, that's, that's the endurance that we need to have. But again, endurance is just an initial result. It's not the end result. Endurance itself has a greater purpose. That is perfect result. Literally, that's the perfect work, which is maturity. God says, in, eff in effect, in my sovereign plan, I have lined up a chain of events that will take place and my finger of testing pushes the first one, which is endurance. When endurance takes place, it actually bumps into maturity. Then it will lead ultimately to a fully developed character. That's what we read here in the verse. A great Christian character is a person who have learned how to handle life in a crucible. What, what we can learn from this is, um, as we started our prayer, we had a testimony from one of our friends, like how hard the trials may be. God was able to lead the life. The same thing here, I think, like uh, whenever I was preparing this message, I had this um, information, whatever may be the trials, we trust in God. Even if a mother loses the child, she thanks God. And even if somebody loses the job, and that person is able to thank God for the opportunity, that's the stretch of faith that brings that endurance which James states that the inevitable trials, they bring in, bring in more troubles, but they also have a specific purpose. But in these, question, in these verses, when we look into all these things, we might ask a question, okay, we have troubles, we have tribulations, but how is it going to work in my life? Whatever the troubles we have, even if it is like neck deep, how can you handle these various troubles that come in our way? We will look into verses 2 to 4. As we read here in the fourth verse, it says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. We will look detailed into these words because like James gives us four commands here in these verses. If you look closely into the verses, it says the second verse, consider. And in the third verse, he says, because you know right? Just circle that word, no. And in the fourth verse, he tells, let. Let perseverance finish. And he gives another command of asking, which is in verse 5. What he mentions here is, consider the very first word we will take into consideration now. Consider it your joy. It is actually an evaluating word. Why I say an evaluating word is the outlook determines the outcome and attitude determines action. God tells us to expect trials. As I mentioned earlier, it's not if you fall into various temptations or trials, but when you fall into various testings. The word is when, not if. We, we are God's sheltered people. That's, that's the main point here that James is trying to mention. Like um, We are not scattered people, but we are God's 
sheltered people. No believer should expect an easy Christian life. That's what we see in John chapter 16, 33. Jesus warns his disciples, in this world, you shall have tribulations. Paul also mentions the same in Acts 14, 22. He tells us, the converts, that we must go through tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. So we can't expect an easy way out here. So we have to go through the temptations and trials. The second word here is like count and consider what we have seen here. I'm sorry, the, the very first word again, like there are more verses, but I, I am because of the timing, I think like we can skip over and uh, go, over, go over to the, the second one. But if you look into the word like consider, it means evaluation. If you, if you look into uh, Philippians chapter 3, 7, uh, written by Paul, he says, I once thought that these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of Christ, what he has done in my life. So the point here is like Paul is evaluating his life and he sets a new goal and priorities. Things that were more important to him is now considered garbage in life of his experience in Christ. So the emphasis here is when we face trials of life, we must evaluate them in the light of what God is doing for us. This explains why the dedicated church can have joy in the midst of trials. We also see that in Hebrews 12 to fixing our eyes on Jesus Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for joy set before him, he endured the cross, scroning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne. See, like our values, they determine our evaluation. If we value comfort more than character, then trials will upset us. But if we value the material and physical things more than our spiritual things, we will not be able to count it as joy. That's the, that's the main point here. And if we live for the present and forget the future, the trials will make us bitter, but not better. So when trial comes, immediately you think like we need to thank God and to adopt a joyful attitude. Outlook determines outcome. To end with joy and begin with joy. But we all might have a question, is it possible to rejoice in the midst of the trial? That's what James write in the second word, no. In the third verse, it says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. There is also a question like, why do we Christian believers know that it makes it easier to face trials and benefit from them? So that's, that's the question, right? To answer that, it says like faith is always tested. You, when you look into the life of Abraham, he was tested to increase his faith. God tests to bring out the best out of us. But when Satan tempts us, it brings out the worst out of us. So testing of our faith produces our true nature that is inborn in us to bring out. So the testing of our works is not against us. That's the point we need to understand here. The testing of our works for us is not against us. <clears throat> if, you, if you look into an example, uh, in olden days, when they had that gold hunt, one particular person would go and try to dig out the sand and he will be trying to find the gold. And if he thinks that he has found a gold particle, he takes it to one of the assessing people 
to check whether it was the, the true gold or not. But the small speck of gold, what he has in his hand, might not be worth a million dollars. But when the assayer looks at it and says, come on, person, like you have got the real gold, so you have found a place where you can find gold. The similarly, when God tests us and when we respond in the right way by not breaking ourselves, but building in us a character, becoming more mature, then God will be rejoicing by the way we have responded, that God will be thinking, okay, come on. We have mended and, mended and molded this person in the right way. His faith is tested and he did not crumble to the situation. That's what we read in Romans 8.28. And we know in all these things, God works for the good who love him, and who have been called according to his promises and purpose. I'm, I'm, because of the time constraints, I think like I will not be able to um, go into some of the verses here. But uh, if you find time, you can read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 17, and um, Romans 5, 3 and 4, and Hebrews 10, 36 which all these verses focus on the patience. The patience, it's not a passive acceptance of the circumstances, why we have these verses. God, God wants us to be a patient person because it is the key to every other blessing he is giving us. When we learn to wait on the Lord, the Lord can do great things for us. There, is, there, is, there are examples in the Bible where men, when they were going ahead of God, they fell down to temptations. Look at Abraham, how he ran ahead and had Hagar, and he fell down. And we know how Moses ran ahead and he killed the man. So the only way God, God can help patience and character in our lives is through trials. Endurance is not attained by reading something or attending a seminar, or even praying. You cannot experience endurance just by reading the Bible or listening to any of the sermons. It is to be experienced. When we have the patience and the character that needs to be developed by God, we need to go through all the trials and the tribulations. If you look into Romans 15, 4, it is written for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scripture and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. If you look into the Bible, if you look into the characters of Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, all these people had trials. And that there was a purpose for the trial. God fulfills his purpose and we trust him. And there is no substitute for an understanding mind. As I told earlier, Satan can defeat the ignorant believer, but he cannot overcome the Christian who knows the scripture well and a believer who understands the purpose of God. And then when we look into the fourth word, let if you can look into the fourth verse, it would say, let perseverance finish its work. God, he cannot build our character without our yielding. That is without our cooperation. If we resist him, he chastens us into submission. But if we yield to him, he will accomplish his purpose. And again, God is not satisfied in a half done job like a human. He wants to be having a perfect work that is finished in us. He wants us to be mature and complete and God's goal for us to live a mature life. And Paul, 
he outlines three things that are involved in a complete life. There is the work of God for us, which is salvation. I have already mentioned these, but still I want to emphasize on this one. There is the work of God for us, that is salvation. This is already completed on the cross. If we trust him, we are saved and we attain this salvation. And there is the work of God, what it does in our life, that is sanctification, building God's character to become like Jesus Christ, transformation, that is the tra sanctification. And then the third emphasis here is work what God does through us, that is service. So first one is salvation, second one is sanctification, and the third one is service, what we are created for to do the good works for him. So God builds our character first, and then he calls us to service. We must work in us before we can work through us. Look how God made Abraham to wait for 25 years to have his work done through him. And you know, Joseph had to wait for 13 years. And for Moses, 80 years and plus the 40 years he was in service. And Jesus, he took three years to train his disciples, building their character. The main emphasis here is God cannot work in us without our consent. We must yield to him. We have to surrender our will to him. If we go through trials without surrendering, we will not be mature, but immature. We will be like immature children. If you, if you look into first chapter, uh, first chapter of, uh, um, sorry, first Peter chapter five, it says, humble yourself therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. So we need to, we need to yield ourselves surrender ourselves if at all we need that total transformation within us so how do believers rise above this trouble in everyday life we face them with the deliberate attitude of joy that's the point james is mentioning here calling to mind the process god is working in our lives and cooperating with the entire process how do we do this the next point here is ask. We need the wisdom. That's what we see here in the verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom. James, after giving a behind-the-scenes look of like the purposes of the trials and the practical advice, how to endure them positively, he continues the theme by answering certain questions. You might have the same question. Why do trials overwhelm us? Why do we sometimes cave in? What things block the joy of enduring that crucible? The big answer for all these questions is our lack of wisdom. If we fall into the trials, we have one option. Ask God for wisdom. Wisdom actually is defined as the ability to view life from God's perspective. James says that this is the kind of wisdom that comes by prayer. In the fifth verse, he says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. It might be a very simple thing like a prayer, a short prayer. Lord, in the midst of all this loss and heartache and failure, Lord, I ask you your wisdom. Help me to have that wisdom. Let me 
see what is going see what is going on in my life lord help me to view things from your viewpoint and please give me the faith not to give up that would be a better prayer kind of thing when we go through all the trials when we have all the overwhelming pressures that are going on in our life just as a lack of wisdom makes an overwhelming lack of faith it can result in caving in here in the second verse i'm sorry the sixth verse it says saving faith but sustaining faith but when you ask you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind the opposite of faith is doubt james compares here a person who's doubting as the surf of the sea driven by the wind you can see the same analogy in luke 8 24 and 25 when the disciples they were on the boat and they were rocked by the storm and they were afraid you know if you remember the verse you can read when time permits go back into luke 8 24 and 25 jesus calms the storm and the very first words that come out of jesus mouth is where is your faith where is your faith jesus james describes this kind of deep seated doubt as a double minded thinking it is something we always clutch in our hands my way and god will that's double mindedness this double mindedness it indicates our impurity in a person we have got a set goal we need to attain that goal but what we do is whatever way we can find to attain that goal we try to do it without god's will we have our intentions but god is not willing to do it there is a small analogy or a small story people used to say like they used to how they used to catch a monkey in the african continent is make a small hollow bamboo stick and throw some rice into it and when the monkey tries to put its hand into the hollow block to reach the rice it clutches its hand holding the rice but once it clutches its hand it is not able to remove the hand from the hollow bamboo shaft and by that the people who made the trap will be able to catch the monkey i think like the same analogy is for us we try to attain things by our ways but we are not letting it loose we need to yield ourselves to god who will be able to transform us into the image of his son and if you look into verses 9 to 11 trials affect everybody even the rich and the wealthy of whom some you believe they have a shield i think like if you know like most of the rich people i'm not uh, saying like every other rich person but some of the rich person who are not believers they always think they have got a protection because of their financial strength they have the material possessions they have they think like even if they fall they have got a huge cushion of their wealth that will be able to help them out of their troubles but at the same time if you look into a poor person he may not have that material strength but all he had is all he has is the position in christ if you look into the verse here it says but the rich shall take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wild flower 
for the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. It blossoms, falls, and the beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away, even while they go about in business. So what is, what is Paul mentioning here is, when the rich fall without their wisdom and faith, their fall is going to be a terrible thing because they do not have the God's wisdom. But a poor man, they have got a high position now. What is that high position? The high position is the position of the believers who have Christ in them. If you look into Ephesians cha um, second chapter, verses six and seven, it says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus. So for the wealthy, the worst trials is that they lose all the riches or when trouble comes, their money will not help their lives. That's, that's the main emphasis here. As you look into the last verse of this section, verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. If you look into Matthew 5, and the last two verses of that Beatitudes, 10 and 12. I think like James is trying to have a similar Beatitude here, wherein he mentions the blessed blessings. The one who stands up under the trial will be blessed. If you look into some of the other versions, um, the New Living Translation, the blessed, the word blessed is replaced as genuinely happy. That's what Jesus mentions in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. He uses that for almost like nine, nine times. Blessed are those, blessed are those. Similarly, James writes here, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial and he will be rewarded in heaven for the crown of life. So we will be rewarded in this life with maturity, wisdom, and insight, and into God's purposeful plan. So these are the messages that we read in these first two, 12 verses. And what are the applications, if I want to say like, what are all the applications? excuse me, applications when we see from these first 12 verses is, is it easy for us to praise God when things are going fine? And are we doing the same when we go through trials? When the circumstances are so bleak, circumstances are looking so dark, and there is a violent storm, are we able to praise God? Are we doing it? Are we able to praise God during our difficult circumstances? How do we respond during those times? Are we having that inner joy? Do we have the wisdom? We Do we have the confidence in him? How do we handle that adversity? When trouble comes, it's essential that we respond with wisdom. That's the main emphasis like we see in these 12 verses. Do we have that wisdom? And if we do not have that wisdom, are we asking God for that wisdom? And again, 
when we ask that wisdom, are we having that surrendering will within us to acquire that wisdom? The wisdom that is required for handling the troubles. Going back again to Romans 8, 28, we know that in all things God works for the good. For those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. In all things God works out for good because he has got a sovereign plan for our life. Turn our attention to our Savior. And we look into the suffering of the people who we saw here. Abraham, David, Joseph. Are we considering those people as models? I forgot to mention about Paul. The person who endured a lot, who suffered a lot, do we have that endurance? When trouble comes, we should respond in faith. Do we have that faith in us? Do we have that confidence in God's promises? In the midst of the trials, it may appear that God has allowed everything to crumble. That's our thinking, right? We lack all the insight and the faith. We are not able to see beyond our circumstances. We think like everything is going to be a huge catastrophe, right? But our single-minded hope in Jesus, our focus on the faith and the confidence we have in God to have the right attitude, surrendering ourselves to God, trusting Him, obeying Him, yielding to Him, that will give us the strength and the encouragement. We see the similar kind of strength and encouragement that Paul is given to Timothy. Let us have that confidence. Let us try to endure things. Always remember, God has not left us all alone to face all these battles. He has given us his words. He has given us the Holy Spirit indwelling in us to face the trials, to respond in the right attitude, to have the perspective to see things how Jesus sees, to think how Jesus thinks, to respond in the way how Jesus would respond. Trust in him, obey in him, surrender to him, yield everything. Let us not be like the monkey holding on to worldly possessions, my way, God's will, that will not happen. My way and my will, that will lead to destruction. His way, his will, we will receive the crown, surrender ourselves. Lord God, we thank you 
for your wonderful words, Lord. Yes, Lord. Everybody's walking through kind of an adversity, a trial, a temptation, storms that are always brewing around us. Mm. Circumstances look so bleak. Things look so dark. But Lord, we have you in our hearts. We have your words in our hearts. You have commanded that you will lift us up and you will not allow us to sit in the darkness, Lord. Help us to endure. You give us the wisdom, Lord. Help us to open up our mouths and talk to you. And you give us the wisdom, Lord, so that we will not lack anything. Help us to have the vision Give us the proper perspective, Lord. Help us to see things beyond what we couldn't see through your eyes, Lord, so that we may not fall or fumble in our lives. Help us to seal this message deep in our hearts so that our conduct, our character, and our conversation be transformed like you, Lord. Bless us the way that you want to have us in the future, in the present, Lord. Lead us in the right path. In whatever we do, help us to glorify your name, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for you speaking to us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Amen.